All right, everyone. Jay in Washington welcome, welcomes back Representative Carolina Amnesty. Let's go. Again, I would like to welcome Representative Carolina Amacy of House District 45. Uh, that entails uh, Champions Gate, uh, Windermere, Disney, uh, I believe also um, Oakland, and Horizon West. Again, thank you for joining us, Representative. How are you? Thank you so much. It's, it's an honor to be back on the show. It's truly an honor. And I'm doing well, fighting the good fight. Uh, we're a few days away from election day, so we're very enthusiastic, trusting in God, believing that the best is yet to come. And the most important thing is that trusting the will of God and the people. The people will decide this November 5th. So my, my faith is placed on God, and um, he's in control. And we're just uh, doing Always. our part, which is working, pushing forward, and uh, working very hard. I think my opponents have me working very, very hard. This race is not a normal race. I think if yes. we look back at the jurisprudence of all the other races, this one is very unique. Um, it's It's been a target race from all spectrums, all um, angles that you could think of, but I'm not backing down. I'm fighting the good fight. And at the end of the day, it's up to the voters to decide. So we're very enthusiastic and very happy. It was uh, approximately four or five months ago that we last had you on our show. And uh, there was a joke made about uh, the Orlando Sentinel running against you. At the time, you did not have a, a Democratic challenger. You do now. However, it does seem like you are running against the Orlando Sentinel and a Democratic challenger. And um, it, it, what's your words on that? You know, it's very unique. Um, my family came from Venezuela many years ago. And when you talk about the American dream and you talk about uh, America as a country, you think it's the greatest country on earth and our constitution, the greatest constitution that has ever been um, created because it's founded on biblical principles, truly. And that's what I believe. But when you look at the First Amendment, you think about the freedom of speech and you think about the right uh, for reporters and journalists to really uh, provide insight, to do their journalistic uh, work. But when you see that in newspapers is not just reporting on, on facts, but rather instilling and uh, persecuting and coming after a specific individual and the family and calling out all types of um, spectrums and, and issues sure. and lawfare. I mean, it, it, it goes beyond the First Amendment. It goes beyond the right to write something about an individual um, or, or beyond the opinion. Um, it, it's, it's beyond that. It's, it's really persecution. It's really politically motivated coming after an individual simply because uh, they don't agree with my political ideals and my values and my beliefs. And we saw that in this election where um, I didn't have a challenger early on and they were very, right. um, they, uh, certain sectors, I'm not just pinpointing the Orlando Sentinel, but certain sectors in the, in the journalistic world were really desperate looking for somebody to run against me and really compiling and really filing all types of things against me um, to bring me down. And I've Never in my life did I think that this could happen in America. You see this in other countries where the press is motivated to bring somebody down, where it's working with the government, where it's working with, with uh, certain sectors. But to think that it can happen here in the country where the press can can report on something that's not factual and then later on get some type of um, situations to occur. It, it's very unique. It's very unfortunate. But I'm just smiling every day and thanking God. He knows why he allows things. You know, I, I really believe. That. Um, you know, now it's the time in my life where I'm putting my faith into action. I grew up in church my whole life, listening yes. to my father preach, listening to other ministers, helping the church, helping the church in every angle. And I would listen to the sermons on Sunday about, you know, David fighting Goliath or yes. the 
of Esther um, and how God called her to govern and all these different stories that, that occurred that really strengthened faith. But at the time, I couldn't really put it to a personal aspect. I couldn't really identify mm -hmm. the story personally because I've never had gone through anything like that. And now that I'm living so much, I can say, OK, now I understand why God said this. Now I understand why this is occurring. And, and it's just to strengthen us and to strengthen our faith. And that's that's the aspect that I'm taking in the angle. So if the press wants to write whatever they do, I I just smile and I thank God. You know, it's name my day. They're they're raising my name my day. There's a there's a they saying are. that that sometimes um, in, in certain aspects, bad things, God allows it for a purpose. And I really believe that in this scenario, that's that's what's occurring. They keep writing about me. They keep doing everything they're doing. I mean, it's a big operation. I'm sure they have my name on a wall and, you know, they're trying to pin down how to bring me down. But nonetheless, um, you know, they're, they're, they're working uh, in my favor because it's, it's strengthening me. It's giving me stronger faith. It's uniting me even more with my core principles and values. It's, it's strengthening me to the capacity. Well, I will never back down from those values that I believe in, no matter what they do to me. And um, that's that's where I am. That's my core. But it definitely is very unique that a newspaper um, has that ability. Yes, uh, the Orlando Sentinel seems to not be able to take your name out of their mouths. I mean, there's an article just today uh, about your race. I understand that the Democrats have targeted uh, your uh, district, your race, uh, among four others, uh, four or five others, uh, to try to flip and make a dent into the supermajorities that the Republicans have. However, more importantly, more important uh, representative is what you just said about putting your faith into action. How are the recovery efforts going on in your district from Hurricane uh, Helene and Milton? Also, Hurricanes yeah. Helene and Milton. It's it's going very well. Just last Saturday, I was in the town of Windermere with the uh, mayor and the town manager cleaning up, making sure that our, our local town is, is beautiful and it's clean and it's precious mm -hmm. and it's welcoming. And we want to make sure that everyone is safe. So we, we really reached out uh, via newsletters. I made phone calls, text messages, spoke to community leaders. I spoke to the mayor of Okoe as well. I reached out to our local officials to see if there was anything on the state level that I could do, that I could be of help. And I reached out to constituents to ensure that they were safe and sound. So thank God in our district, we are doing well. Um, we are recovering. We are cleaning up. We're in that stage of cleanup, but no major damages. And I just thank God for that. I've seen what's happened in Pinellas County and Pasco County. It's just completely right. devastating. Our prayers and our hearts are with those people and we're just praying through, but thank God in our district, we uh, most um, were, are doing very well and safe and sound. Excellent. That's great. Do you think that the uh, recent, recent storms uh, will have an impact on the voting? We have early voting happening in a couple of days, uh, October 21st. Do you think there'll be any impact on uh, the voting in West Orange? You know, I think it will. I think it will have an impact because people are seeing, you know, you have a, a candidate that during the hurricane season, during these difficult moments is dormant, um, is really relying on newspapers. And then you have uh, another uh, candidate in the race that's working hard, that doesn't care about what the newspaper says, doesn't care what they're doing to her, that doesn't care, you know, nothing that's going surrounding. She is literally uh, working hard and, of, of course, um, I would say that we're working very hard and we're focused on the people of District 45. They're throwing everything they can at me, but I'm not uh, backing down from the work that I believe God has called me to do. And I think the voters are seeing that. The vote, Even on the national level, we see that we have a candidate for, for the presidential race who, who really was just fundraising and campaigning throughout the season. And then you have former President Trump who's working hard. I mean, his son was with Samaritan Purse. Um, an organization that was founded right. by Billy Graham. I'm, I'm a big fan of Billy Graham. Now it's led by his son, Franklin Graham. And they right. were out, you know, working hard, serving, providing uh, resources and food and, and shelters. I mean, this is the work that the church and that people in our community um, are called to do. And this is why we're, we're elected officials. We're here to serve. It's not about, you know, getting famous. It's not about uh, resources. It's about serving the people that God has called us to serve. And in my scenario, it's District 45. So I made sure I was out and about serving my community. And at the end of the day, people are going to vote their conscience and they're going to vote um, and what they see that's really someone who's working very hard for them. You have a very diverse uh, district. Uh, about evenly split among Republicans, non-party affiliates, 
and Democrats. And your legislative session, your very first, uh, was a successful one for you. What are you hoping to accomplish in this next legislative session? You know, this uh, first term, I, um, I will tell you that I went in there and I just fought very hard for what I believed in. And I made sure that I looked at the mail piece. I literally still have the mail pieces that I sent throughout my first cycle. And I remember going through the mail pieces and looking line by line, what did I promise that I would do? What, what was that? And I would write that down and I would say, okay, well, what can we do? I said, I was going to combat human trafficking. What can I do for human, tra- you know, to ensure that we protect people from being victims of human trafficking? I looked at veterans. What can we do to support our veterans? And that's, that was the angle that I did. And, and now, uh, we're, of course, we have mail pieces going out and right. the most, the focus of my, uh, legislative session coming up, God willing, will be the economy. We're seeing the highest inflation in 40 years. That's going to be my focus, supporting our small business owners, lowering taxes. That is going to be very important for me is lowering taxes, ensuring that people have more money in their pockets and to ensure that they can thrive and families can thrive. And the second is, I still believe there's more to get done when it comes down to human trafficking. I uh, raise the age for young girls who work in the entertainment industry. Um, Let me tell you, that bill uh, became so controversial. They came at me from every angle. I think I still have a lot of people very upset with me because of that bill, Uh, even people within my own party, surprisingly. But I will tell you that I worked with um, several Democrats uh, across the aisle on that policy, and it was extraordinary to see how we came together to ensure that we protect the young women of Florida, which is exactly. to raise the age of 21. That way we don't have young girls, 17, 18, 19, uh, working right. in these industries that have been identified as the really the gateway for human trafficking. So there's much more to get done. So those are going to be my two priorities is the economy, combating human trafficking, which goes into public safety. And the third element, which is going to be very important, of course, is, is the education, is supporting our public okay. schools, supporting our teachers, and ensuring that parents have the rights to decide over their child. I know that with the storms coming through, uh, residents are very concerned, especially on the West Coast and also the uh, Big Bend of uh, Florida, about uh, property insurance and the coverage made available and how claims will be handled. Um, Will the governor, do you believe that the governor will address this? And is the Republican delegation, including yourself, uh, willing to pay even more attention to uh, property uh, insurance issues? Well, I can tell you that I will personally uh, work very hard to address the issue. I think the fact that our premiums keep raising is out of control. The fact that we have these storms that have come in and destroyed and devastated areas and sectors and raising now, this is going to raise our crisis even more. It, it is highly concerning. It's something that needs to get done. And when I mean needs to get done, it's not just a political statement. I mean, we actually have to get into into the legislative session and really fight hard to bring these premiums um, at a normal rate. I mean, we're seeing that we have less competition when it comes down to the insurance markets. Now we have insurer uh, carriers that are just simply uh, denying insurance. Um, we have uh, carriers who are raising their their policies constantly. I mean, this is not even like annually anymore. This is where people are getting letters and saying, hey, your your coverage has increased, you know, a thousand dollars or such. I mean, it's just it's chaotic. And we have to fight for for balancing and common sense approach when it comes down to the insurance. I believe in the free markets and I believe that we need to bring more competition to to lower the cost of insurance. I believe yeah. that we need to able to to ensure that we have more uh, companies in Florida. We need to bring more insurance companies to Florida. We need to create more products in the insurance uh, angle and the insurance market because we need competition. I mean, the fact that we only have a few companies here and we're all trying to get insurance, it's, it's chaotic. And the fact that mortgage companies require property owners to have insurance and yet they're being denied insurance. I mean, it's just a it's a chaotic scenario for homeowners and for, for people. Yes and in our community. So something needs to get done. It needs to be addressed. It shouldn't be a political statement. It shouldn't be Republican versus Democrat or Democrat versus Republican. It should be a common sense approach where we can all unite and bring a solution to the table. Excellent. I love that bipartisan approach. And our last interview, I talked uh, a lot about uh, your bipartisan approach and your successes with uh, veterans legislation, uh, what you just stated about the human trafficking uh, legislation. Uh, it, it blew my mind when you told us that uh, I believe the average age of uh, uh, of a woman working in uh, adult entertainment at the uh, 
adult clubs was 19 years old. I just kind of, I mean, that took me aback. And I like the approach of uh, your your family focused, um, family forward uh, legislation or policy. Um, is there more that you can do representing your district uh, that will address some of those things about, you know, putting family first and, 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 and supporting families, you, uh, if you may, please. Absolutely. There's always much more to get done when it comes down to supporting families, ensuring that they thrive. And, and part of that is cutting the red tape. I mean, we have so many regulations right now that hinder the ability for someone to start their own business, to start their small business. And we need to empower families to be able to thrive, to live the American dream. And that's Amen. reducing regulation. That is uh, ensuring that government is there to help families, not to create burdens and obstacles for families. You know, I, I really believe the structure of government is law and order and, and public safety. But when we Thank see you. no of, of, of government in all angles of life, I mean, it just makes it very difficult for people to thrive, for people to have, you know, their small restaurant, their small business. It's, it's just very complex. I actually was in celebration a couple of weeks ago and I was meeting with, uh, with an owner that was just starting a coffee shop. And they were very excited, but it started, you know, it took them six months, six to eight months just to start the the, the coffee to open the coffee shop because of permits, because of, you know, yes. regulation. And a lot of people don't have, you know, six month worth of paying a mortgage, of paying utility and paying employees until the government comes in and says, okay, well, you're, you're okay to open. You can open now. People don't have that kind of money. If you're a small business owner, if you're somebody in the middle class, we just don't have that kind of money. And I include myself in that. And we want to make sure that families thrive, that people can thrive, can live the American dream. The American dream shouldn't be a fantasy uh, before 2000s. Right now in 2024 and 2025, we should be thriving in the American dream. We are the greatest country on earth. And that is my focus, to empower families to be able to live that dream, to own their restaurant, to own their small business, to be able to thrive, to lower their property insurance, that they can keep more money in their pockets so essentially they would spend more money. And of course, government spending that makes, you know, on the taxes, the government has the, the necessary resources uh, to, to create its operation and to have public safety and yeah. all of that. But government should not create overregulation and keep increasing taxes and, and do nothing about these crises. I believe that there's so much to get done. And, and my focus is the family. I think the first institution created by God, I always say this, it wasn't government. It was not corporations. It was not businesses. It was family. Genesis 1, God created the heavens and the earth. And then he established what we call family, Adam and Eve, and then so forth. They had children and, and so forth. So the point is, it, it's, it's family. Government should be there to empower families. We want families to Amen. thrive children to be protected. We want public schools to have the resources to provide quality education. We want parents, to, if they decide to go to a private school, we want them to take their voucher, to take their resources, which they paid for because it's their taxpayer dollars, to go to a private school if they decide to do that. We want children to thrive, that if they have any needs when it comes on to mental health, that they have access to, to guidance counselors, access to psychologists, access when it comes down to the health scenarios that they have access to these resources that we're there to provide when it comes down to public safety. So there's so much to get done. And it's very unique that nowadays we have people that just don't in, in government that just don't believe in pro family values. They don't believe in empowering families. They believe in an agenda where it's only specific to, to one group of people, whether it's about race or, or gender, it's just, it's unbelievable. And um, there, there's so much to get done, despite of any gender, despite of any race, despite of your religion, government is there to really provide uh, and help and provide those resources that are necessary. Yeah. And, and that's my fight in the legislature. And, and I'm glad you mentioned that um, people in government, as we look at the top of the ballot, uh, the, the two candidates for uh, president and the recent controversies uh, out of the uh, Kamala Harris campaign in regards to uh, President Obama and his comments to black men, uh, Magic Johnson, his comments to black men and so forth and so on, surrogates for her campaign. Um, and we kind of talked about this uh, off, uh, off camera before the show. I, I'm a Chicago Democrat because I was born and raised in Chicago and I learned, you know, that politics is a blood sport. And so that's my viewpoint. Uh, however, being a, a Democrat here and, and well, being a um, straight black man 
Democrat here in Florida, I, 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 I know that I'm not looked upon within the Democratic Party as a demographic that matters to them. And again, going back to the comments made by or the campaign uh, to black men, to black and brown men and men in general, it, it seems like well, we've, we've been a forgotten and ignored demographic with your district being so divor- diverse and the Republicans being able to attract more uh, men, more black men, more brown men into the um into the party or to their policies, uh, where do you stand in regards to being able to bring in a broader demographic um, from your point of view, policies, et cetera, et cetera, bring in a more, uh, a larger diverse demographic uh, to conservative values? No, that's a wonderful question. Um, and I haven't shared this publicly. I don't, I don't believe I have, but I will tell you that my whole life, um, I've been in the North Orlando region. Uh, my family's school, my church has been in the North Orlando region, which is very near to the Pine Hills community. And literally my whole life in Central Florida and my family has been serving the North Orlando near the Pine Hills community. My okay. Life. And that can be fact checked. I know that there's a lot of uh, uh, news, you know, newspapers that love to do that. Um, that can be fact checked, and I think they write about it, but they write about it in a very negative way. Well, let me tell you, I'm very proud of that. Yeah. Very proud of being near and dear to that community. And it really bothers me so much that the Orange County Democrats have done nothing for the Pine Hills community. It bothers me that there's no resources, that they don't fight for appropriations, that they don't fight for the community, that the roads are abandoned, that the lights are abandoned, that you have uh, Publix closing down and all you have is a small grocery store that you have to drive 15 to 20 minutes away from this community because there's a lack of leadership in this area. There's a lack of leadership Mm -hmm in this area where it's driven by a lot of minorities, Hispanics and African-Americans. And there's there's nothing that government is doing about this. There's nothing that the Orange County Democrats are doing about this. There's nothing that Democrats in the legislature are even advocating about for this community. This community has been abandoned for so long. And I will tell you, my heart hurts for this community. I've seen the need, I've, I've witnessed the need in this community. And this has been a big perspective in the life of my parents. I mean, they've pastored for many years uh, a church in this area. We have the school in that area. They have the university yeah. in that area. And that's where uh, their heart is. And I applaud them for that, that uh, his, uh, Hispanic leaders, pastors in this community are willing to raise up a flag of blessing, a, a, a flag of light in the midst of so much darkness because government, leaders in government have abandoned this area. And it breaks my heart. But going back to our district, District 45, which I represent, it really also breaks my heart that Democrats like to talk about, they love to talk about gender and they lo- like to talk about race and they try to divide us. And it's not about race. It's not about gender. It's about the need of our constituents. You know, when I sure. when I take a call from a constituent who has a need, who uh, there is a flooding problem. You know, I had a constituent reach out on a flooding issue that they had. I don't mm-hmm. ask them what their gender is. I don't ask them what your voter registration is. I don't ask them what their race is. I simply ask them what their name is, what the problem is, and I tell them how I'm going to get it fixed and what the solution is. And that's the leadership we leave, we need in Orange County. And that's the problem that the Democrats have in Orange County, that it's only about their click of people. It's only about what fits their narrative. It's only about what's going to make the headlines or they're going to talk about all the great things supposedly that they're doing for, for certain communities. Well, I have news for them. I'm a Hispanic. I am a minority and I've been in Orange County mm-hmm. my whole life. And I can tell you zero things that they have done for our community. I can tell you zero things that they've done for churches, for people in our community, for people that are homeless in the streets. I can't tell you how many people that are homeless have reached out to my family, to our leadership, uh, to the school, and that, that the school has been able to provide resources. My father had a clinic many years ago and, you know, we had a food pantry. We helped the community. We served. I've been in serving my community for so many years. I grew up in ministry. This is what churches do. They help people. And when you have yes. church 
calling their local cities and you have churches calling their local county governments and they're not able to get any answers to to problems that they may face when you have churches calling their local leaders and saying hey we have this family that doesn't have where to stay that doesn't have where to go what shelter can i take them and they tell you well all of our shelters are occupied i'm sorry please call again but then if you have them in your church and you and the church becomes a shelter, then somebody will make a complaint, probably one of the newspapers that are against uh, Christian churches, and they'll make some type of complaint and call the fire or they'll call the county or they'll call this. So it's just a vicious uh, scenario where there, there really isn't a solution to the problems. And we need common sense leadership. We need common sense leadership that's willing to help these people and help those that are in need and really put people first above the politics, above your voter registration, above your gender, above the community you belong, your race, your religion. We're people and government should be there to help people. And uh, that's my frustration. I tell you, that's the one of the biggest frustrations I've had. I, I studied political science. I remember being at UCLA. Yes, and um, just analyzing, like, wait a minute, why isn't the local government, why isn't these uh, Democrats in the, in the county doing anything about it? They complain, they complain, they complain, but they do nothing. And I will tell you that in the legislature, we, at least in, in my case, we work in a bipartisan way. That if one of these leaders actually wanted to get something done for this community, hey, my office is open, let's get it done. I don't work in my in the legislative process on the basis of headlines, let me tell you, because if that was a case, um, that, would, that wouldn't be working too well for me. It, it's not about headlines, it's about getting the work done. And most of these leaders, uh, to not pinpoint anyone in specific, they're, they're lacking that. They're not willing to get the work done. They're just attending these cocktail hours, receptions, the fundraisers, <laughs> The meeting meetings with these big uh, corporations that provide a lot of resources for their campaigns, um, but they're not really focused. And I'm focused. And I think that's one of the reasons why I've been under attack so much. It, it doesn't fit their agenda. It doesn't fit their narrative. It doesn't fit their purpose to have someone like me in the legislature. That's true. I mean, you've been targeted since day one of your first election in your first term. Oh, and yeah. One question to you, and you touch upon this, uh, is the opposing party, are Democrats relevant now with the Republican majority? And likely there will still be a, re there will be, uh, let's not miss words, there will be a Republican re majority in the legislature after this election, and perhaps maybe a supermajority. Um, are they still relevant? And are there people, two part uh, question. Are there Democrats that um, you believe will be willing to sit down and talk to you and get some bipartisan uh, policy and legislation passed? Absolutely. I actually know one, not in Orange County, unfortunately. I wish we had more of those in Orange County that are willing to work across, uh, across the aisle and get good policy. But I know a couple, and I will tell you that my human trafficking bill, there was a member Correct. Opposing party that worked very dearly with me on that bill the last few days, and the, her testimony was just extraordinary. Her faith is just extraordinary, and I, I don't want to share any names, but there are good people within the Democrat Party. I mean, of course there are. There are good people in, in both, and there are bad people. There are very bad people in both parties. We see it across because that's just the way it works. But I will tell you that the unfortunate part is that we have more more bad people in the opposing party here locally that are just not willing to get it things done. They're not willing to to really work hard and get things done. And that's very unfortunate. When I meet bad people, I don't say personally, but rather in the political right. spectrum, where they're just they're they're not willing to work across the aisle. They see that it's a Republican. Oh, and, and if you say a MAGA Republican, you know, they'll 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 turn the eye and they won't work with you and they won't, you know, they'll just put a cross on you where where they they're just not willing not even to have a conversation. Uh, and and this should not be about party lines. It should not be about uh, Republican versus Democrat. This should be about right. women's legislation. We're here to pass laws, laws that affect that even affect their lives and their families. You know, this should be a common sense approach where we're all part of this big table of getting things done. And it's it's very unfortunate that we don't have that on the local level. And what really upsets me, going back to what I was sharing, is that the North Orlando Pine Hills community has been abandoned for so long, so mm -hmm. 
long. African Americans, Hispanics, we have a lot of people from the Caribbean, we have Haitians, Jamaicans, they've right. been abandoned for so, so long. And I'm a witness of that. My family has worked very hard to serve that community. And what do the Democrats in the area do? They do absolutely nothing because it doesn't fit their narrative, because it doesn't fit their agenda, because they're not part of a specific clique. They're normal people working hard, trying to make a living and trying to prosper. And, and, and most of them are actually believers. So, you know, we see also on that side of the spectrum that it seems like the Democrat Party is only targeting one specific area and one specific community and the rest just doesn't matter to them. It's very unfortunate. Right. And, and I know I should be a good Democrat, but then again, I, I because I'm in this space, I do know more than just your average voter. and. You know, I'm sure Democrats will pull their hair out uh, when they see this interview. And I still have my Democrat card here in Florida, so they haven't taken that away yet. Uh, however, um, they will pull their hair out. It's like, David, push back. However, because I'm a well-informed voter and I am involved in this space, what you're saying has validity to it. I've seen it myself. I've talked to and members of various communities across Central Florida. And so I hear and see a lot more than uh, the average voter. Um, so I believe what you're saying is true because I know it's true. Um, moving forward here, uh, you have focus on family initiatives and, and uh, protecting our veterans, uh, honoring our veterans, uh, protecting women, honoring uh, those individuals uh, who are vulnerable, and also the sanctity of life. Uh, the Supreme Court upheld the 15-week abortion ban, thus triggering the six-week ban. We have at the national ticket Kamala Harris saying, hey, Women have the right to their reproductive uh, freedom. Uh, there's Amendment 4 here in Florida uh, that supports abortion up to viability, however that's defined. Um, but more importantly, um, I see the conflict and the Democrats' rationale in supporting abortion the way that they have, but also at the top of the, of the ballot, um, uh, a $6,000 child credit for uh, new parents and uh, of, of newborns. Uh, help me make sense of this. Uh, there's, there's a conflict in, in that, and um, it, it seems like it's pandering. Well, it's, a, it's absolutely just um, shocking. Their, their ability, and I will say that the Democrat Party is very good on marketing. And it's fascinating how they promote abortion on the basis of calling it reproductive health. Mm -hmm. Reproductive health is not abortion. Reproductive health, the health of reproducing, we're talking about life, should not be uh, associated with abortion. And, you know, I'm, I'm seeing all these mailers that my opponent is sending out and it talks about, you know, calls, yeah. calls me he calls me an extreme because I'm, I'm pro-life, which I believe in exceptions, but I'm pro-life. To me, a life is, is, is a life. It should be protected. It has its rights. Um, we're, we're talking about a human being. We're not, we're not talking about mm -hmm. anything else, but rather a human being when we talk about this scenario. And he, he calls me an extreme. And then on the opposite side, he says, well, I stand for reproductive health. But what's interesting is they're trying to equate reproductive health with abortion. And, and, and it's just such a marketing scheme that it, it's it's very unfortunate to see. And I really pray and I hope that voters uh, don't let them um, just really uh, draw that narrative, but rather see beyond that where, where really they're talking about abortion. And, and most of these people even believe that abortion should be at the seventh, the eighth and ninth month when we're talking about there, there's a formed baby in the womb. I mean, it's just it's shocking how yeah. radical this is how weird, you know, weird has become a, a national word. It's it's very weird. This this party is very weird. It's very radical to say that a, a woman has a right to practice an abortion at the ninth month when we're talking about a baby is, is form, a human being. Um, I think the common sense approach on, on this matter, I think people are going to, um, families are going to push through. I, I really believe that we're going to see this um, on election day on, no on November 5th. You know, people are going through so many issues right now when it comes down to the economy, uh, when it comes down to the access um, of really starting their business, creating revenue, uh, prospering. Um, the economy is a number one priority. And when you have the yes. vice 
and just talking about abortion and, and it's all about abortion. It's really um, it, it's it's out of touch with voters, specifically those voters in minority communities um, like like the one that I belong, the Hispanic community. I mean, I think the Hispanic community is saying, like, what in the world? I don't want to talk about abortion. I want to talk about the economy. I want to talk about our family. I want to talk about how can we thrive and live the American dream. So they're completely out of touch. And I will say that uh, the abortion issues is they're just they're very radical. They're extremely radical. This is no longer about exceptions. We're no longer talking about a woman who has been raped or a young girl or, or scenarios that are very unfortunate where we do believe there should be exceptions. That that is that is sure. my belief. Um, there should be exceptions. We can't say, oh no, it's it's a hundred percent per life and, and use that word of when we're talking about a young girl, a nine-year-old girl who potentially could have been, you know, uh, in a very bad scenario, you know, raped and so forth. So there needs to be exceptions. We need to talk about that. Um, but we're talking about the life of a human being, a baby in the womb. And we should also acknowledge that it is a baby and that it has rights. And personally, I'm pro-life. I believe in the exceptions. But these Democrats, they're just very, very radical. They're very weird. I mean, seven, eight, nine month abortion is insane. And um, I just crazy. can't come and wrap my head around why this has become a national topic where we actually have real problems in our communities. We have lack of resources. We have the economy, the highest inflation. We have uh, wars now in the Middle East. We have Ukra Ukraine and Russia going on. I mean, we have so many things on the global level and, and, and locally as well that really affect our day-to-day -day lives to be talking about extreme measures and extreme policy. The Democrats in this level, and I don't mean this personally, but just the Democratic Party, um, they're just out of touch with, with policies that everyday life Americans are going through. I, I can agree with that uh, on several points. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm 54 years old and the Democratic Party that I grew up with uh, uh, is unrecon unrecognizable today and uh, it's unfortunate for America. Uh, I do believe there is some consensus. There, there is some middle ground. Um, one last question, particularly in regards to families and uh, President, President DeSantis, there you go, David. Uh, <laughs> Governor DeSantis um, in the legislature was able to pull uh, push through uh, legislation uh, regarding family law um, in regards to alimony uh, during divorce. And my question is, will we see uh, more legislation like that that will attempt to address, you know, families breaking up and trying to create a more balanced uh, family law um, environment? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I am committed uh, to ensuring that families thrive. I am committed to policy that helps families thrive in all angles when it comes down to the criminal justice system, when it comes down to uh, family law, when it comes down to the process, education, uh, health, the environment. Uh, families should be the epic center of, of everything that we do, whether it's uh, we're talking about the judicial process or we're talking about the environment. It, it, it should always be around mm -hmm. families. And that is my commitment in the legislature. Excellent. In closing, is there anything that you want to say to those unpersuaded, undecided voters that I guess exist out there, uh, but more importantly, those uh, nonpartisan, nonpartisan uh, affiliates uh, who seem to be making the difference in many of these elections? Is there something that you want to leave with them? Absolutely. It would be an honor to count with their support once again. It would be an honor to count with their vote this November 5th. I'm working very hard and I will continue to work very hard across party lines. It doesn't matter whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or an NPA. It, what matters is the policy that really enhances and, and provides a benefit to our community holistically. And I'm a fighter and I'm going to go to uh, Tallahassee once again, God willing, if I have their support to fight and fight very hard for this district, fight for this district to have the resources ne necessary for water quality quality, uh, infrastructure, uh, stop all the, the, the large traffic that we're seeing that really takes us a long time to get from point A to point B uh, to ensure that our children are thriving when it comes down to mental health as well, to care for public safety, combat human trafficking, and ensure that Central Florida still is a public safety law enforcement, pro-law enforcement, a uh, law and order uh, area that is thriving, that is protecting yeah. uh, families, that is caring for the tourism industry as well, caring 
caring for the economy and ensuring that people are thriving. I want families to thrive. I don't want a specific sector. I don't want a specific race or gender. I want everybody, no matter your race, no matter your gender, no matter your beliefs, no matter where you come from. If you live in my district, I'm going to fight very, very hard for you. And yes. I would be honored to count with your support. Um, I wish you all the very best. God bless you. And I think November 5th is going to be a big day and we're going to celebrate together. That's excellent. Uh, Representative Carolina Amnesty, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much again uh, for reaching out to us and uh, agreeing to uh, do this interview. We welcome our uh, Democratic peers, uh, your challenger to be on the show. Uh, we've put out many invitations to the Democrats. Uh, however, as I was saying earlier, uh, it seems like uh, the Republican candidates have been uh, more than willing to uh, spend time with us and, and tell us about what's important for their communities, for their constituencies, and uh, what they hope to uh, bring to uh, Tallahassee. I really do appreciate it. Thank you to your staff and to our listeners and our viewers. Thank you. This is a great interview for everyone in District 45 to sit and listen and watch. You're being representative by one of the best ones, in my opinion. If I could vote for you, representative, I would. I live in another district. However, good luck to you and good luck to your campaign. Thank you. We'll see you, everyone, the next time.